pleasure to stand up and speak on this bill. Every time I have worked on a bill since I arrived in your Lordship's house um, nearly eight years ago, I've always thought this is the worst bill I've ever seen. And you know what? Everyone is, but this is a stinker. And it's quite obviously not going to help the police. If you can't, if you produce a policing bill and you can't get former police chiefs, the UN Special Rapporteurs, the Joint Committee on Human Rights and the European Centre not-for-profit law on your side, something is wrong with the bill. Now, I would also like to point out, of course, that the noble lady, the minister, when she was speaking, mentioned that um, the government was increasing the number of police officers by 20,000 and increasing the budget. But I would like to point out to her that, in fact, um, the police are not yet up to the numbers and don't yet have the budget that they had when the Tory government took over 11 years ago. So this government isn't particularly kind or good to the police, and policing is tough. We, know all, we all know that, but this bill won't help. Um, I, I, surprisingly, or, or interestingly, or however you want to say it, I, um, I also have, like the noble and learned Lord, um, uh, Lord um, Faulkner Thuriton, I have 11 issues that I'm concerned about in this bill. I think there'll probably be more by committee stage, and my noble friend Lady Bennett has her own issues as well, equally serious and equally disturbing. And so I will try to gallop in the very limited time that we have to speak on uh, second reading through these issues. The first thing is in part two, the unprotected data gathering and sharing. I mean, this is a very disturbing part of the bill because, um, it, uh, it, 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 for example, um, it mimics what has happened with the PREVENT programme, and that programme has disproportionately targeted Muslims <coughs> and minority ethnic communities, and it's likely that the infringement on human rights would be felt most acutely by those already over-policed and over-represented in the criminal justice system. And, of course, these measures could have a disproportionate impact on marginalised communities and groups advocating for social change with Black Lives Matter, Muslim people, women and climate change activists, amongst whom I am, I hope, a guerrilla fighter, um, being particularly affected. This, group, this bill only makes it more difficult for those oppressed groups to have a voice within our society at a time when it's so desperately needed. Um, I agree uh, with the noble Lord, Lord Paddock, when he says that we shouldn't be adding to this bill. I agree very strongly there. We should be removing. In fact, if we could remove the whole bill, that would give me a few more nights of good sleep. But in the meantime, we can fight on all these things. Um, on part three, the public order, uh, it undermines democracy by limiting freedom of speech. It poses a threat to the core purpose of a protest that allows people who feel unheard by decision makers to actually speak and be heard. This part silences them. And when we talk about um, disturbance and unease from noise, I'd like to complain about the noise we hear from the other end of this palace. Um, uh, it, it often displeases me and upsets me the way the House of Commons carries on, so perhaps we can apply this bill to them. Um, uh, move, moving on, this bill allows future Home Secretaries to determine the definition of what constitutes a disruption. Really? <laughs> you really think we trust Secretaries of State to do that? And of course, throughout this bill, the vague language used means that the bill leaves too much up to the officers at the scene. And as we've seen this year, for example, the police do misinterpret laws, partly because they're not given good clear instructions by the government, but that's another issue. But, for example, at the Sarah Everard Vigil at Clapham Common, that was the most... It was a terrible police, uh, piece of policing. And so to allow such broadly defined legislation through only leaves the door open to more poor policing, which the police themselves do not want. Um, moving on... Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, finally, I would like to point out that uh, there is um, nothing, of course, in here for, to protect women and girls, and that is an absolutely tragic oversight. Um, and finally, finally, um, in part five uh, with road traffic, um, I would like to insist on the full review of road traffic offences and penalties that was promised in 2014. We've waited 17, seven years, so perhaps that could happen. 
We also need to strengthen the penalties for serious hit-and-run offences, those where the driver knew or reasonably ought to have known that the collision was likely to involve fatal or serious injury, and tackle the exceptional hardship loophole, whereby convicted drivers routinely evade driving bans by pleading this would cause exceptional hardship. And there was a classic case of someone who claimed it would be exceptional hardship if he couldn't use his Bentley to drive one mile to the park to walk his dog. Yeah. 